Good afternoon and welcome to today's discussion on modernizing government IT, citizen services, cybersecurity attacks, and federal state collaboration. My name is Ha McNeil. Today I'm representing software.org, the BSA Foundation. I hope you and your families are doing well during these challenging times. Software.org is a DC-based nonprofit organization that works to help educate stakeholders about how software-enabled cutting-edge technologies work and how they improve people's lives. We're here today to discuss the risks and opportunities that governments at every level face when making decisions about investing in government and IT infrastructure. This is a timely issue. Members of Congress are currently considering whether to include funding for state and local IT modernization in the next COVID-related legislation. There's an important relationship between federal and state governments regarding IT funding. It's important to remember that the vast majority of federal benefits that go to individuals are actually delivered by state governments and their IT systems. So the federal government has an important stake in maintaining and modernizing those delivery systems. Also, the federal government has primary responsibility for national security and modernizing state and local IT systems is key is key. It's also true that state governments and their CIOs make cybersecurity a high priority in the work they do. In fact, the National Association of State Chief Information Officers conduct an annual survey to state CIOs on their top priorities. This year, for the seventh year in a row, state CIOs identified cybersecurity as their number one priority. IT modernization is an important issue under any circumstances, but the COVID-19 pandemic and the ensuing wave of remote work for millions of public sector employees makes today's conversation especially important. As Congress weighs further COVID-19 relief legislation, we must clearly communicate the value of government funding to state IT modernization. This discussion is also very much aligned to software.org's work to educate policymakers about the benefits and potential of technology. We recently launched a new report, The Case for Modernizing IT Now, which highlights the value of modernizing IT to improve the resilience of the public sector. I look forward to digging into this crucial topic during today's panel. I'm so pleased to be joined today by Dr. Samantha Ravitch, a commissioner for the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, Calvin Rhodes, the Chief Information Officer for the State of Georgia, and Irvin Rogers II, the Chief Information Officer for the State of Ohio. Before we start our panel discussion, let me remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the chat function of Microsoft Live, located at the right side of your screen. These questions won't be visible to everyone, but they will come to us and we will get to them as time permits, once all presenters have an opportunity to share their initial thoughts. Thank you to those in the audience who have already submitted questions in advance of the event when they registered. First, we will hear from Dr. Samantha Ravitch. Dr. Ravitch is a commissioner on the cyberspace. She serves as the chairman of the Foundation for Defense of Democracy's Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation, she serves on numerous public and private boards. Dr. Ravitch, let's kick this off with a question. The Commission's report does an excellent job describing the cybersecurity threat and how state and local governments fit into the picture. Can you help us understand that picture? What is the threat landscape and how do state and local governments fit in? Well, thank you. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm really interested in what my co-panelists are, are going to say um, from their view from the states. Um, but from the federal level and, and having been in national security for many decades, no surprise, it is a really scary cyber world out there. Um, Chinese cyber operators have stolen hundreds of billions of dollars in intellectual property to accelerate China's military and economic rise and undermine US military dominance. I've been writing on cyber enabled economic warfare for a number of years now. Um, but we see beyond that, we see Russian operators and their proxies damaging U.S. public trust and in, in the integrity of American elections and democratic institutions. China, Russia, and Iran, and North Korea all probing critical infrastructure with impunity, or at least to date. Um, extremist groups uh, using these networks to raise funds and recruit followers and, and, of course, criminals just 
plain old criminals getting smarter in terms of how to use the internet, leveraging global connect networks to steal from individuals, companies, and, and governments. The United States is struggling um, to deter and punish bad actors in cyberspace, and, and things aren't getting any better. The digital connectivity that really has brought economic growth and technological dominance and an improved quality of life um, to nearly every American has also created a strategic dilemma. Because in the past, in the Cold War, for instance, the US government would have had to be really solely empowered with protecting the security of Americans and America. That's not really the case right now. Right? In cyberspace, it's not just the US government and state and local that have to have this responsibility. It is also the private sector, it is also individuals. Um, and we are really making our way to try to figure out how to do that on the new battle space and in, in the new landscape. So it was with that backdrop that the 2019 National Defense Authorization Act um, empowered the congressionally mandated Cyber Solarium Commission. So we were, we were tasked with answering two questions. Right. One, what strategic approach would help defend the U.S. against cyber attacks of significant consequence? And two, what policies and legislations are required to implement that strategy? So I, I really highly recommend you all go to www.solarium.gov and at least read the chairman's letter, right? The first two pages, because it talks about how we are all in this together. Um, it talks about state and local, which we'll hear more about. Um, it really references we need to think differently on creating uh, more trusted supply chains. Um, and, uh, and actually, we're going to get to that as well, because trusted supply chains mean hardening our supply chains for software. Um, so the commission, let me just also uh, talk for a moment. The commission recommended that the U.S. adopt a layer deterrence to help us become more secure and resilient in the cyber battle space. So that means changing and shaping behavior, right? Working with partners inter internationally, but also from the US federal government, working more closely with SLTTs um, and the private sector to foster best practices. It also means we have to, a second layer, build better resilience to deny benefits to the adversary for those who seek us harm. And again, SLTTs are key to providing resilience. Of course, we have to impose costs upon our adversaries and that probably still um, remains with the, with the federal government. So how do state and local, um, tribal and territorial fit into all of this? Well, think about it. State and locals operate some of our um, most important critical uh, infrastructure that American adversaries in order to chip away at our pillars of national power, right? Uh, states, localities hold voter registration information. Um, they deal with the electoral, electoral systems, election systems. But also water, and I just, one moment, because I think this, before I hand it over to my co-panelists, I think this will really catalyze for the audience online what we're talking about. So um, recently in April, Right, looking out across the world, Israel thwarted a cyber attack on, on control systems at its water facilities. Officials in Jerusalem called it a synchronized and organized attack aimed at disrupting the industrial computers that undermine Israeli water facilities. Um, uh, according to Open Press, the Israeli Water Authority said that if passwords could not be changed, the system should be disconnected from the internet entirely. Right. Um, it seems that Iran was the perpetrator. Nothing actually really went down, um, but it was very, very close. Our own water supplies are quite vulnerable, and most of the 70,000 water utilities in the U.S. are controlled by municipalities. Right, They're not in the hands of private sector. They are in the hands of a uh, state and local. Um, and to reduce costs and efficiencies over the years, a lot of these utilities have embraced digital connectivity, but few are implementing the security systems and processes to protect their network. So the Cyber Solarian Commission kind of called this out along with other things and, and codified that um, sector specific agencies, for instance, like the EPA, have to be working closer with state and local to give them the tools 
to monitor and to protect these critical assets. Because look, we heard a lot about adversaries in the in the queue, uh, in the in the grid. Um, but you can live without power for a little bit. Try living without water. So one thing um, before I hand the mic back, the commission thought long and hard about the proper role of the U.S. government to help the make the whole supply chain of software more secure. And I'm a big fan of the BSA framework for secure software, and it's not just because y'all are hosting. Um, I, I think it is along with, with the NIST secure software development framework, um, really, really important because the federal, at the federal level, federal tools and standards, um, they're not specific enough. They, you know, they'll say, you know, have best practices, um, uh, but they don't really get into the nitty gritty uh, of what really needs to be done. So the Solarium did not want to be too prescriptive because tech changes very quickly. Um, but uh, we did want to incentivize the delivery of secure lifecycle by design software to the government. Um, and I look forward to hearing from my co-panelists about how they think that can be incentivized through procurement. Um, and with that, I will turn it over and um, we'll go on. But thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ravitch. Now we'll hear from Calvin Rhodes, the Chief Information Officer for the state of Georgia. In this role, Calvin has led the state's public-private IT transformation and consolidation effort. The initiative has strengthened security, modernized infrastructure and networks, improved reliability, and increased transparency in the state's IT enterprise. He came to state government from Paladin Investments, a private investment company he established and has served as a managing partner for since 2009. Calvin, as one of the longest serving state CIOs, you've seen the evolution of state IT up close for the last nine years. Georgia has been a real leader in that evolution. What does it mean when people say Georgia's IT system is heavily evolved? <clears throat> Hello, I, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to join in the discussion and, you know, and I thank you for the question because I am pretty excited of what we've accomplished here in Georgia and, you know, pretty much relate that to uh, three different areas. Uh, senior state leadership, it's very important that we uh, get uh, this strategic direction as part of the governor's uh, strategic vision. Uh, and part of that, you know, was even us uh, having the option to change our business model if that was necessary to improve our, our operations. So it's really a long-term partnership that we ended up establishing with the private sector and through our service providers that has been a, a huge part of what we've been able to accomplish. Uh, second area that I think I've already referenced is it's a long-range commitment and, you know, systems are huge, they're complex. Uh, we often work with our federal partners as new systems, to, uh, new uh, uh, items that that the federal programs would like us to do in a different way. And so a lot of that drives what we do as a state. So, you know, greater insight into having a visibility into that is important for us. And then um, it also takes funding to accomplish these projects and, and not only the uh, funding for the project itself, but also the operational dollars to continue uh, moving us forward. So I was going to dive into those a little bit in greater detail. So back in 2009, uh, current U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, was our governor, and he established the vision to, for us to modernize, which is a lot of standardization. He wanted to make sure that we had reliable systems, so the uptime was extremely important, and then the recovery of those environments if something were to happen. And we've talked already a little bit about cyber, but being able to recover systems if something happens to the point that you, you've got to make sure you can you know, protect the citizens' data and be able to uh, go back at least to a period of time that was not very long ago. So since then, two governors have also uh, seen the importance of leveraging technology so that we can be more efficient as an organization. And we can look at, you know, um, opportunities or depending on where you sit, could be a problem. But technology continues to evolve at such a fast pace and cybersecurity technology, <coughs> excuse me, even at a greater rate of change. And when I'm speaking, I often ask the audience, you know, raise your hand if you believe that technology continues to change at our hyper speed and with even greater complexity. Well, with almost without doubt, everyone's going to raise their hand. And the thought here is, I'd ask you to think about, is that pace of change is likely the slowest it will ever be today in our lifetime. And so that really has 
us to have to focus on how we solve these problems in a different way. So uh, we talked a little bit about procurement already and especially in cybersecurity. Uh, you know, we don't have our normal uh, time frames to make a, a year to make a decision, the year to do a procurement and a year to implement uh, because especially in cyber, you know, those technologies are changing every six months. So part of our model was try to, trying to embrace how do we buy some of these uh, results that we're looking for, you know, through services and through service providers so that, again, more like the private sector, we can move quickly and adapt uh, new technologies and new tools. And so that's one of the areas that I think we've been most successful uh, here in Georgia is having the flexibility to do some of those things through our uh, multi-year contracts to where we ask our service providers to provide us results and then be able to move tools in and out uh, as they become available in the private sector. So I think, uh, you know, you mentioned being the longest serving CIO, I'm almost at the 10 year mark, uh, but I think an interesting fact around that is there's 25 states today with CIOs less than a year of tenure in their, in their role. And so, you know, trying to be able to provide consistent direction and uh, is one of the challenges that I think um, most states are dealing with. Uh, the few of us that have the longer tenure are truly the exception. So I think that's an area that we as states will have to look to try to uh, find ways to improve uh, tenure of leadership. And then funding becomes an issue. Uh, I, you know, the complexity of what we work with, the number of people it takes to deliver projects uh, as we integrate across the state with other systems. You know, when you think about that, you know, just for Georgia, there's thousands of systems that make up our broader IT system and each of those are uniquely different and the agencies and the missions that they serve are very different. So trying to give flexibility as uh, new uh, requirements come from our federal partners. Uh, you know, as a CIO, I'd like to look across the enterprise when we're doing something new and find, OK, if if a federal program is allowing us to put in uh, some cyber protection, how can I use that across the enterprise? And having greater flexibility to use those tools across all of my thousand systems is something that's very important to us and something we continue continue to talk about. You know, it's easy as we, uh, again, continue to look at the threat landscape and how that continues to change. Uh, there's many challenges there that it states, uh, just like the federal government, have to look towards and find ways to uh, seek improvements in those areas to lessen our vulnerabilities. You know, the uh, individuals out there, the organizations that are trying to do us harm, um, they're only becoming more complex in what uh, their devotion is to cause us disruption. And so the bar continues to move. So when we make an investment today, um, it's not a one time and you're done. Uh, we've got to continually uh, be finding ways to improve our systems. And a lot of that's around sharing information amongst us. So as one group has learned to do something that we have a much better communication um, between us and our federal partners, but it's also a burden upon us to make sure we consistently think about our local governments and try to assist them. So that's really been a much greater focus. And I'm sure we'll get into more of this as the discussion continues. <coughs> but I guess in wrapping it up, I think my role uh, and I think Irvin would agree with this, is we're becoming more of a broker, especially as we adopt uh, cloud solutions and trying to find better ways to work with our many partners that we have and doing it in different ways is really, uh, I think, a key change that is going to drive and we're going to continue to see as, uh, as uh, we try to mature our organizations in this new normal of uh, many different things that we're having to deal with. Thank you, Calvin. Next up, we'll hear from Irvin Rogers II. Irvin serves as the Chief Information Officer for the state of Ohio. Prior to this appointment, Irvin served as the CIO at the Ohio Attorney General's Office, where he focused on developing IT strategies to help better serve and protect Ohioans. Irvin, you've been in your current role for about a year and a half, and have already been able to achieve some significant reforms, including initiatives like Innovate Ohio, Cloud Smart, and Cyber. Can you tell us how Ohio has approached modernizing IT over the last couple of years? Certainly. Thank you uh, for the opportunity um, uh, to be on this uh, esteemed panel. Um, you know, I've got a doctor, 
Um, I, I've got uh, a, a senior statesman that's that's been there for 10 years. Calvin is a phenomenal guy and one of the, the uh, state CIOs that uh, uh, pulled me in right away um, during the uh, very early days. Um, and so thank you for that. Um, I, I am extremely honored and um, uh, I, I love my job. Um, and so it's very easy for me to um, spend hours uh, doing uh, this type of work because it's very rewarding. Uh, you see the fruits of you know uh, the work that we do day to day um, uh, every day. Uh, it's a matter of you know changing lives uh, to impact the taxpayers uh, specifically for me for the state of Ohio. Um, so, you know, you mentioned a number of initiatives. Uh, I, I am extremely, um, uh, really, really uh, grateful to be in my 18th month, uh, which means uh, from a NACIO, uh, you know, charting perspective, you heard Calvin say that there are 25 uh, state CIOs are serving less than a year. I am on the uh, high end of the, um, uh, from a 10-year uh, perspective, you know, uh, hoping to one day, you know, um, uh, see the likes of, of, of Calvin from a 10 year perspective. So with that being said, um, from Innovate Ohio perspective, Innovate Ohio is, you know, the way that we're trying to innovate, um, the way that we're delivering government uh, digital services is at the core of this administration. Uh, so Governor DeWine uh, wakes up and, and thinks about, you know, uh, as he makes decisions, he, he wants to make decisions based on data. Uh, it's all about the data, and um, that was the, the thing when I was at the Attorney General's office. That continues to be the thing here with regards to uh, our, our, our strategic direction uh, from, from a uh, technology perspective. Uh, Innovate Ohio is led by our uh, Lieutenant Governor, John Houston. Uh, I partner with him uh, directly. We, we started this partnership at the administration, um, and so uh, that's something that can you guys still hear me? Um, I'm assuming you can. OK, perfect. So I'm going to keep talking. Um, so the um, Lieutenant Governor and I uh, partnered together uh, where in which he's focused in on the user experience. I'm focused in on from a technology perspective and where we meet up is really from a technology uh, strategy uh, perspective. Uh, we are focused in on uh, a number of um, initiatives. We've met with all 32 boards, agencies and commissions, come up with a list of opportunities in order to um, uh, see where we can, you know, uh, change the face of providing digital services. And I think that, um, you know, with the core mission of this um, initiative, it has really transformed the way that we have been able to provide services during this COVID-19, uh, not allowing or not having to have folks come into physical offices. And I think that has just been tremendous uh, value add uh, to uh, many of our, our, our citizens and taxpayers um, here in Ohio. Uh, to be able to get those online uh, services. The other things that you, you quickly talked about uh, were, you know, uh, Cyber Ohio. C cybersecurity is um, is something that I wake up and, and go to sleep and thinking about, uh, sometimes dreams, dreaming about, and I have to kind of check and slap myself to say, was that a dream or was that, you know, uh, reality? Um, so if you start and begin um, your initiatives, uh, projects, uh, investments with security in mind, you'll have a, a better outcome at the very end uh, it, it's a it's everyone's um, opportunity uh, to be a part of uh, making sure that from a cybersecurity perspective that we're doing everything that we can do from end to end. Um, and so when you have that kind of a concept in that um, uh, tenure, that is uh, uh, something that I think the um, uh, governor DeWine started uh, Cyber Ohio when we were at the AG's office and we brought that over to the executive branch to give it uh, a greater uh, exposure. Uh, to many of the folks that, um, um, uh, and so it's really focused in on small businesses, uh, you know, counties, uh, et cetera. So we're pushing out information um, that uh, from a small business perspective, those folks might not have um, the ability or uh, have um, that information uh, at their fingertips just based on the sheer amounts of uh, of, of, of the investment that it, that it takes. Uh, many of them might have uh, cybersecurity folks that are next door neighbors. So we're trying to provide that 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 foundational elements of key things 
you know, patching your systems, making sure that you are, um, you know, staying attuned with um, announcements and, and uh, advisories that are coming out um, and that, uh, you know, you have antivirus uh, installed. So some, some of those basic things, educating folks that, you know, um, again, that core model of making sure that folks understand that um, cybersecurity is everyone's um, uh, concern. And so now Cyber Ohio lives underneath the Innovate Ohio brand. Uh, we're really, really excited to continue to uh, push that, uh, that that agenda forward. So with that, I'll uh, I'll turn it back over. That's great. Thank you, Irvin. Um, and many thanks to all our panelists for sharing your views. Um, I would like to invite you to further discuss some of the perspectives that each of you raised. Let's move into the Q&A portion of our discussion today. Dr. Ravitch, our first question is for you. The Cyberspace Solarium Commission recently released a pandemic annex with observations from the pandemic as they relate to the cyber, uh, security of cyberspace. Can you tell us more about the cybersecurity challenges that the pandemic poses and how state governments can guard against these threats? Yeah, sure. So we released the Cyber Solarium Commission report on March 11th, um, 250 people up on Capitol Hill. Um, as, um, as I was talking to uh, uh, a big hug. Oh, I seem to gain feedback. Um, yeah, big hugs from people and back slapping. And, and when, you know, we were really glad when two weeks ended that uh, we didn't, uh, what didn't become a hot spot in the release of the of uh, the commission report. But, but even when we released the report on March 11, one of our 80 plus recommendations, one of them was on continuity of the economy. Um, how do you prioritize and start an economy if in the event of a major cyber attack? looking at things like what are the critical nodes, how do how do they all relate to one another, um, what does the federal government need to do, what do state and locals need to do, the private sector. We never thought we'd have a live fire exercise, um, you know, within weeks of actually putting in writing, we need a continuity of the economy plan. Um, but as March turned into April and, and May and the commissioners and the, the awesome staff led by Admiral Mark Montgomery, who was our executive director, um, we really sat back and, and, and thought um, we need to collect observations. While COVID is in cyber, um, there were a lot of overlays. Um, and uh, so we released a pandemic annex panics for short, which highlighted 32 of the commission's um, initial recommendations, but tweaked some of them, right? So we had originally called out the need to expand the uptake, for instance, of secure cloud services, right? But in our annex, we called on Congress to include digitization grants to SLTT governments as part of the COVID-19 stimulus because just kind of hectoring and lecturing from Washington, um, telling you know state and locals, uh, make sure you use uh, uh, secure cloud services without providing the basis and the funding to do so kind of can fall on deaf ears. But we also proposed four new recommendations as really as, as we were watching the increase in all of our vulnerabilities as we work from home, we spend more time online, we with the government remotely. So we had four more recommendations. One, pass an Internet of Things security law. Two, support nonprofits that assist law enforcement, cybercrime, and victor support, victim support efforts. Three, establish the Social Media Data and Threat Analysis Center. And four, increase non-governmental capacity to identify and counter foreign disinformation and influence campaigns. Um, I want to, there's one other piece that kind of flows through both the original report and the pandemic annex. Um, and it was something actually through, through my think tank, the Center for Cyber and Technology and Innovation, um, that we've been looking at for the past year, which is the insecurity of home networks, right? So, you know, when we, in COVID, the federal government sent home 80% of its workforce thereabouts. And while classified information should have been going back and forth on home networks, still, nonetheless, sensitive government information. Um, and all of a sudden, you have people working at home that aren't cybersecurity experts, have had no idea how to change the password for the router, have their 16-year-olds on the network downloading who knows what. 
Um, and, you know, we from the think tank have been urging that um, we need to be more strategic about helping key individuals um, from at least the federal government, I would urge from the state as well, secure home networks. Uh, maybe a geek squad of sorts is, is necessary. But if we're spending all this time talking and thinking about how to make us more secure as a whole, and then we're sending people back home to work on very, very vulnerable home networks without the tools or understanding about how to help themselves become more secure, we're just buying a, a, a world of trouble. Um, so, uh, the, again, the panix, the pandemic annex is up online at uh, www.solarium.gov. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Ravitch. Um, Irvin, our next question is for you. You've already discussed some of your priorities when you started your term as Ohio State CIO a year and a half ago, but the world has changed since the pandemic hit. How has COVID-19 shifted the importance of IT modernization? Would you say it has increased the demand for IT modernization efforts going forward? You know, I, I, I'm really excited, um, you know, let no pandemic go uh, uh, wasted, if you will. Um, I have seen a tremendous amount of uh, um, innovation take place with regards to solutions that are being offered by our esteemed IT colleagues uh, in partnership with the business areas. Um, our vendor community, um, you know, we're all working together for one common goal. Um, you know, one of the things that was really, really important to me was collaboration. Uh, when I first started, um, I think that you get a lot, you can get a lot more done when you create an environment where folks feel freely to share information um, and uh, are, are, are willing to, you know, fail fast, if you will. And so, uh, over the, you know, the, the, the year two, start of the year two, six months in, we really have taken that collaboration to the next level, which is really one team, one goal. And I think uh, through the course of, um, I remember it uh, like it was yesterday, I was shaking in my boots, my first interview as state CIO 90 days in um, at the very first NASIO mid-year, um, didn't know quite what to expect. Um, and they're like, what are you excited about? And so I hemmed, hawed, and uh, uh, and then finally it just, you know, the passion kicked in and I start talking about cloud smart, you know, cloud smart initiatives. We need to go from cloud first to cloud smart. And so we really have been pressing the gas on that initiative. And that is one of the things I think has, has really been the foundational element uh, to uh, take what was already there. It was already a great foundation in place, but we've been able to take that foundation to the next level. Um, and uh, it, it has been really, really uh, a, a very cool thing to see uh, evolve over time. I really have really intelligent, smart people that work uh, on our team. Uh, Tracy Romeg, you know, um, she's our cloud smart. Uh, you know, she's leading that uh, particular initiative underneath Mark Smith. And so um, as we continue to, to charge forward, you know, people say, well, what's your cloud smart? What does that mean? Well, what that really means is that from a center perspective, we are we are we are administrating to make sure that, again, you heard me say that cybersecurity, you need to begin with that in mind so that in the end that you have a better outcome. And so we're making sure that the appropriate security uh, checks and balances and and processes are in place uh, to make sure that uh, nothing is exposed that shouldn't be exposed. Um, you know, it, we, we've just really seen a lot of uh, great things come from that. Um, and I'm excited about as that continues to build and, and we build on top of that, especially with our Innovate Ohio platform. The Innovate Ohio platform is really our means to share information across multiple agencies. You know, you heard me say that Governor DeWine likes to make decisions based on data. Uh, data, 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 data. Uh, we have daily uh, briefings. Uh, here in Ohio, we refer to those as, uh, you know, uh, well, the, the nickname uh, that many of the taxpayers have given it is wine with the wine at, at uh, 2, 2 p.m. Um, and so everybody is tuning in and into that where we're getting the information out to the masses with regards to, you know, the COVID-19 things that they need to do, you know, making them aware of the, the information that's available via our uh, COVID-19, excuse me, our, our, our coronavirus.ohio.gov website uh, where we're sharing data uh, charts, graphs that they can drill down on. Um, it, it's really been uh, something that I'm really excited to see uh, government uh, become innovators. It reminds me of my time uh, as a uh, consultant uh, traveling worldwide, um, you know, um, and, and so th this is just a really, really exciting time 
for state government. You know, we're we're working from home. You know, we're 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 doing things that uh, would take years or you know months to do. We're doing them in days and hours, and so that that's just you know very very exciting. That's wonderful. Thank you, Irvin. Next, we have an audience question from the National Governors Association. Dr. Ravitch, are there any examples of states that are really leading on the issues of IT modernization and cybersecurity? Are there any best practices that come to mind that other states can replicate? Well, Ohio and Georgia clearly, clearly <laughs> are better than all of the other ones put together. You know, oh, Ohio! Obviously, so um, we should all take that to heart. Um, uh, you know, but but look, there you. Know, but the wonderful thing about our country are the states really are the labs, right? They are the laboratories about being able to find different solutions, test them out before, you know, I would think the federal government, you know, has to impose things across the entire country. Um, let's look at what the states are doing. And yes, again, uh, Georgia and Ohio are, are doing awesome things. Um, some other states have some very interesting um, uh, practices that you know are being evaluated for. Do they? Can they replicate? Can they scale? Um, uh, you know, Colorado has has done a, a really great job of linking their information technology um, vertical with Homeland Security. Right, so really connecting. Um, uh, California has also been looking at implementing how to do this. Um, you know, unfortunately, again, California has has been busy with other other issues they've had to deal with, especially on their on their grid and grid security with the fires. Um, but nonetheless, they are investigating very interesting things. Um, North Dakota, right? Um, the North Dakota CISO has really driven towards a one domain everywhere approach. Uh, which is something that I know a lot of people are are looking at. Um, Arizona uh, is is looking at working, you know, obviously more closely with their critical infrastructure, um, and it's something that I myself have been very intrigued with. How Arizona is going to um, look at cybersecurity, given the recent announcement from one of the world's largest semiconductors, um, TSMC. Uh, Taiwan Semiconductors made an announcement that they're going to build a fab in Arizona. Um, when this comes to pass or even beforehand, um, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that uh, have a, a new target on their back from China, right? Um, you know, China probably doesn't want that to succeed very well or we'll mean bolstering all of our systems. I mean, this is the kind of thinking that states are going to be asked to think through in a way they never had to before, right? So think about this. You know, before this recent time period, I'm talking pre-COVID, you know, states would clamor, hey, who can get this new fab, this new manufacturing plant, uh, uh, bring back on US territory these, you know, awesome technologies. Well, we don't just work in our own bubble anymore. There are adversaries that under want to undermine our economic wherewithal in order to limit our strategic options. So if you have a military base or you have a big defense contractor, um, these now fall on the shoulders of, you know, the, like the folks that we're hearing from on the phone today have to think about how do you best provide cybersecurity for the residents of your state, given the fact nation leaders undermine you. Again, never had to do it thinking through it before, um, but now have, have to do it. One last, uh, while not a state, and we'll call out one other, one other actor doing very, very interesting things, and we reference them in the Cyber Solarium Commission report, which is Idaho National Labs out of Idaho Falls, um, doing some very interesting work on industrial control systems, security, um, a method that they call consequence-driven cyber um, security engineering. Um, it's obviously a national lab, but um, you know we are all in this together. So trying to find best practices, seeing how and where they can scale, um, putting the resources of the federal government behind that is, is what we have to do. And um, that's where we added to that effort in uh, the Solarium report. Thank you, Dr. Ravitch. Calvin, there has been debate over whether Congress should include funding for IT modernization in its next COVID-19 relief package. Can you tell us from your perspective what role federal funding plays 
in being able to modernize government IT systems uh, and make them more secure. And in a related question from our audience, how have states fared in using money from the CARES Act to modernize their IT systems? Hi, uh, great. And I apologize that my video is not working, um, but hopefully you can hear me well. Um, I think a couple things come to mind is I would uh, say that, you know, as we have opportunities to partner with the federal government uh, on whatever uh, system requirements are coming out of the federal agencies, you know, again, the ability to integrate those across other areas of, the, of our platforms, I think, is, is critical, critical that we can, can continue to do that. I'm not sure that your audience is uh, aware that, you know, most state governments uh, see about 50% of their funds uh, that come in our, to our state budget come from the different federal programs. And so that partnership is critical. And, you know, we've, we've been able to uh, implement systems like Enterprise Master person indexes uh, for some of the health agencies and, you know, greater fraud protection and multi-factor authentication, you know, just uh, several of those items will come in through an agency and then we'll try to take those and, you know, spread them out across the enterprise. So, you know, being able to do that much easier, I think, is, uh, is uh, critically important as we uh, go forward. Um, from a COVID standpoint, you know, uh, we none of us expected to see um, the volumes of requests coming from citizens, uh, just skyrocketing demand uh, basically overnight. So I know our public health department saw an 11,000% increase in digital traffic coming to that agency. And so, you know, our organization is that we often plan for, you know, spikes in our demand, but, you know, nothing ever of that level. So I think that's an area that, again, that as we look to what future events uh, might occur that we need to a uh, greater plan and have greater capacities for and as part of that will be leveraging uh, many of the new cloud technologies that allow for us to uh, flex up very quickly and then once we no longer need that capacity to you know to move it back down to a more cost effective model i, I know that uh, uh, we put in some chat box and you know 3.1 million questions have been answered since april across this uh, well over a million different uh, users and and very unique questions and that's an area that you know we really didn't have uh, a tremendous amount of expertise and and had to learn and reach out to our uh, private sector partners to help us to get some of those things <coughs> across the finish line as urban said you know we were trying to do things in weeks or months that we had typically taken uh, years to do so uh, there you know, when you stand up systems like this, I think some of the work out in front of us is then to shore up those and make sure that we didn't create security gaps or anything else as we were trying to put those systems in quickly. Uh, an, another need, a significant need that I think most states would say that they have is the real broadband piece. You know, bandwidth, you can have the best systems uh, in the world and if citizens can't get to them, that's really uh, <clears throat> doesn't help all of the citizens of the state. So we really need to focus on it. We need to continue to look at cybersecurity and how we can look at those different threat landscapes. And, <coughs> excuse me. And, you know, just continue to look for partnerships. I wanted to take a quick moment. I, you know, someone mentioned earlier about, um, you know, the military and, and the different groups of the federal government as they look to do things. How, how can we better you know, align and partner with those. So here in Georgia, we uh, were able, because it was an economic development uh, uh, initiative, uh, able to establish the Georgia Cyber Center. So, <clears throat> and so, you know, knowing and taking some of those opportunities where the federal government invests in new installations and new um, abilities uh, to help support its mission, uh, state governments can often uh, leverage that <clears throat> to do something that not only benefits them, but this training center that we built and the tools that were put in <clears throat> also helps with our Army Cyber Command Partners, National Security Agency, but also every state agency, as well as uh, our local partners that we work with. So with that, I think I'll uh, hand it back over to you and see if I can uh, uh, fix my voice. Thank you, Calvin. Irvin, our next question is for you. 
as we know, IT infrastructure supports education, healthcare, social safety nets, and so much more. In what priority areas do you see IT modernization having the biggest impact in Ohio? You know, one of the things that um, I think is 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 an awesome thing is that technology is being you know requested um, uh, far greater, far faster. You know, people aren't asking me for less technology; they're asking me for more. Um, and I think that's a, just a sure sign of our our economy and, you know, our, um, uh, you know, from a development standpoint. But I think the areas that uh, benefit the most, you know, education, right? We talked about Broadcom, making sure that broad, from a broadband perspective that everybody has access um, so that uh, everybody has the, the same opportunities. And so some of the cool things that are taking place here in Ohio is that we're focusing in on that. Uh, we're trying to make sure that opportunities are available for um, not just those um, in those uh, uh, major city areas that have the high band um, with uh, connections, but we're also trying to come up with innovative ways to make sure that the rest of our uh, taxpayers have that, that same type of, of access. Um, so definitely in the education space, uh, we want to make sure that uh, our K through 12, our higher eds, you know, that they have what they need uh, from a uh, innovative uh, innovation, you know, standpoint. Um, I, I think the other areas that here in Ohio, it's it's pretty cool. We have a series of tech communities where you know really, uh, you know, innovation is, is there's lots of innovation hubs, uh, whether that be in Cincinnati, whether that be in uh, Columbus, Dayton, um, uh, Cleveland. Um, we are um, starting to blend those all together and attracting a lot of different uh, international. Um, and uh, major uh, manufacturing, right? So uh, we're really heavily investing uh, through our Drive Ohio initiative with regards to smart smart lanes and smart highways and collecting that data so that we can have the autonomous vehicles uh, to be able to, you know, uh, continue as that software and uh, that hardware continues to, to develop. We want to be the test bed, test ground for that. So I think that our uh, governor, Lieutenant Governor, are laying the framework for that. Uh, and we're encouraging folks to, um, to, to be a part of that um, uh, from an incentivizing standpoint. The other areas that we have a, a program through, um, through the LG's office uh, called TechCred, which allows companies and organizations to uh, train their resources uh, on various um, uh, technologies that are coming down the pipe and get reimbursed for that. Um, and that's that's sponsored through, you know, uh, state funding. Um, so we're really, really excited about the things that are taking place here in Ohio and uh, can't thank uh, Dr. Uh, Samantha enough uh, for the shout out. So, you know, uh, big uh, OHIO, wasn't sure if I was going to be able to, to work that in, but uh, I did. So back to you. All right. Thank you, Irvin. Calvin, um, in light of all the challenges you're facing as a state CIO during COVID-19, how can the federal government help to ensure that the most essential services are consistently available to our citizens? Well, and I think uh, gr um, just greater communication um, initiatives of the, our federal partners would be uh, certainly uh, key into making sure that we are prepared uh, to move in different directions as uh, you make different uh, strategic plans. You know, we look to um, some of the areas like uh, our Department of Labor and I think many states again saw just such increases in volume that no, not only do they not have the people to handle those requests, but their systems are uh, in some of our legacy environments. And so having the ability to uh, look at um, how you could partner with us to modernize uh, some of those systems and uh, embrace new technologies. Um, and yeah, I think that's just key areas that we can continue to look across. And then, of course, um, cyber security investment, you know, when, when that landscape continues to consistently change, um, you know, we have a, a pretty good sharing of information with the different federal partners, but continuing to work on improving that and making it even more timely would be critical. I think as we look to secure up systems across uh, our enterprise uh, as some of the federal programs to be able to leverage uh, some of those tools. Um, but just really the information sharing, uh, I think, is uh, is key in that area. And as they 
look to potential uh, funding opportunities uh, with the next uh, uh, COVID-19 package if one comes, um, just really focusing on public health, um, Department of Labor and cybersecurity would be three key, key areas. Um, and I know I mentioned earlier the rural broadband uh, allowing people, uh, you know, from the education standpoint, uh, students can't uh, remotely connect to their systems and and try to continue their uh, education as we're dealing with pandemic issues. I think those are just really key areas that we could certainly all partner in and provide the citizens a much uh, uh, better and robust solutions that they would leverage. All right, thank you so much for that, Calvin. I would like to thank all of our presenters for an engaging and informative panel. It's clear that improving IT infrastructure can help governments at every level improve efficiency and security to better serve citizens. Software.org and BSA look forward to continuing and facilitate dialogues among all stakeholders investing in addressing this issue. This concludes our event. Thank you again and have a great day.